Welcome to our conversation today. We have a fascinating subject on the topic of shame. Now, if you hear the word shame and are tempted to turn away for various reasons, let me encourage you not to turn away because we're actually going to give an apology for shame, a defense of shame when it's properly understood. It's a beautiful emotion that fits right within the Christian worldview and beyond. Our guest today, Greg Tanelshef, teaches philosophy at Biola along with Scott and I, and he's written a fascinating book. It's called For Shame, Rediscovering the Virtues of a Maligned Emotion. That topic alone intrigued me, and I was reading the foreword, and Jackson Wu describes your book as an apology for shame, meaning a defense for shame, which is not typically how people think about shame. So why would shame need defending? Well, uh, thanks for having me on the show, yes. uh, uh, first of all. Why does shame need defending? It, it, it needs defending for the reason that anything would need defending. It's getting beat up on, and it's getting beat up on uh, by all quarters. Uh, it's being uh, maligned in uh, uh, Christian circles, non-Christian circles, in social scientific circles, in uh, sort of uh, non-academic um, uh, uh, publications. It's it's th there's a widespread uh, suggestion that shame is a is a toxic and destructive emotion, and that we do well to eradicate it from uh, the range of typically felt human emotions. So it needs defending because it's being maligned. It's being uh, beat up on. So, Greg, one of the things I so appreciate about the book is you write with a philosopher's precision, especially when you define your terms. So let's be clear right from the start. How are you defining the notion of shame? And then you claim that it, it's, its opposite is, is honor. So how tell us the, the specific definition of both those terms that you're using throughout your book. Uh -huh. So the word, the word shame, uh, as uh, do so many words for emotions, it, it names both an objective condition and an affective or uh, a subjective emotional state. So we have, to, we have to talk about both sides of that distinction. On the objective side, to fall into shame is, is to be socially discredited in a community. We have lots of metaphors for this. We talk about losing face, uh, losing social credit. Um, um, uh, when you when you lose reputation, when you when you become a person of lesser consequence, uh, you've undergone uh, shame. That's the that's the the condition. To be in the condition of shame is to be in the condition of having been socially discredited in a community. On the feeling side, felt shame is just the the painful sting that naturally accompanies being discredited in a community of people that you care about. And so if you if, if you are uh, shamed in a community of people that you care about, that hurts. Uh, and, and that particular kind of hurt is called uh, felt shame. Honor, then, is just the opposite. Uh, the condition of being honored is the condition of being elevated in a community of people, to become a person of greater consequence, gr greater weight, greater standing, and so forth. And the pleasant uh, emotion that naturally accompanies being uh, elevated in a community that you care about is what we call feeling honored. So you, you, you feel honored when you're elevated in community. You feel shame when you're diminished in a community, if it's a community that you care about. Right? At, at the heart of the premise of your book was so interesting because as a whole, shame seems to just be attacked and disregarded. You're not defending saying, well, I just want people to feel unhealthy, unnecessary shame. What you're defending is saying shame is actually an emotion that God has given us. And feeling shame is meant to drive us to act differently and become different people. So rather than dismissing all of shame, we should ask what is healthy shame? What is unhealthy shame? And with that, what is shamelessness? Which I thought this section in your book was so interesting. So talk about what you mean by shamelessness and maybe an example or two that would really make this concrete. Yeah, so once you've got in place this distinction between the objective condition of falling into shame when you're, when you're in social free fall and the subjective feeling of shame, it's easy to see that you can undergo shame without feeling shame. Right. Mm -hmm. you, maybe you're maybe you don't you haven't seen yet what's happening on Twitter. And so you're not feeling any pain. But my goodness, uh, you're you're undergoing shame. You're losing credit in, in society and you can feel shame even though you're not undergoing shame. 
you, you can feel the the sting. You can feel like you're losing um, uh, face when in fact you're not, when in fact nothing like mm. that is happening. So the feeling and the condition can come apart. And shamelessness names one way that that objective condition and the subjective state can come apart. So people who can suffer social freefall without any pain at all, without any emotional sting, we call shameless. And so if, if, if uh, uh, the, the, the tropes of shamelessness are, are um, people who uh, promote themselves in public all the time, and you can, if you've been with somebody who's a shameless self-promoter, <laughs> you can sort of feel the air going out of the room mm. as they promote themselves, and you can feel them in a free fall, a sort of social free fall. People are thinking less and less of them as they continue to promote themselves, but they don't feel any of it. They don't mm. feel that sting that should naturally accompany that state. Or the shameless tourist who is just all out of whack with uh, the mores of the environment that they're in. They're doing it. And, and for most of us, when we're out of whack with the, the customs of the place we're in, we that there's a feeling that goes with that. It's a kind of uh, a tinge or a, a, an embarrassed sort of painful experience that makes us want to be less visible, makes us want to hide, wants, makes us want to get out of sight, but not the shameless tourist. The shameless tourist just seems completely out of touch with the emotional experience uh, that should accompany their free fall. Yeah, and, and you distinguish between a you know, a shamelessness that has a moral component and one that is just etiquette-based. Like the tourist, we wouldn't you know, find fault with their shamelessness just because they're oblivious to customs. But the shameless self-promoter, we would say there's something morally not quite right with that picture, right? Yeah, I guess I'd say there's something wrong with the shameless tourist too. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just not morally wrong. So there, there are yeah. different ways. Of, there, there are different um, standards that you can violate. Some of them are uh, moral standards that the community cares about. Others are just sort of standards of etiquette. And you can lose credit in society for violations of either kind of uh, standard, for violations of standard of etiquette or for violations of moral standards. Usually you lose credit faster for violations of moral standards because we care more about those. Right. And so your your shame will be greater for moral failure than it will be for a failure of etiquette. But in both uh, uh, conditions, the, the natural and apt emotional response would be felt shame. It's interesting to say it's etiquette, but not moral. There's also the question, should the tourist know and be attentive to etiquette? Maybe there is a crossover with moral responsibility, obviously. Yeah. But that distinction is is very helpful. Now, you make a comparison between shame and sexuality, and I want to unpack that because I think it'll be real helpful to our viewers. But let me take a step back and ask a question we typically ask in interviews at the beginning. I didn't ask you. Why write a book on shame? Of the different things you've taught, it, like, it just intrigued me. Like When I think about books that I'm going to write and speeches I'm going to give, the topic of shame has never crossed my mind. Now, once I read your book, I was like, Oh, I wish I'd come up with that idea. This is a really fascinating topic. So just in your research, being a philosopher, what was it about this that made you spend the time writing, researching on shame? Yeah, a, a number of years ago, I took up an interest in uh, the Confucian wisdom tradition and started thinking and writing about the different ways that uh, wisdom from the Confucian tradition could be ported into the way of Jesus, how we might learn from Confucians, how better to follow uh, Jesus and that immersion in um, uh, classical Confucian Confucian uh, literature uh, sort of sensitized me to the shame honor dynamic because shame and honor loom large in the Confucian wisdom tradition mm -hmm. and shame and honor both have important work to do in the formation of flourishing people and communities. And so I'd, I'd already been sort of uh, uh, shaped by my study of Confucianism. And so then when I started seeing all of this anti-shame literature, uh, both in Christian publication and in, in secular publication, uh, s something just seemed off to me. I mean, th the idea that shame would be intrinsically toxic or that it, that it has no work to do in, in the formation of moral communities, it immediately struck me as something that would sound absurd to a Confucian um, uh, informed mindset. And the more I studied it, the more I thought it should sound absurd to all of us, <laughs> not just the Confucian. But it was through my interest in Confucianism that I that I came to be interested it was in shame. spurred by what was going on in culture. Yeah. If I can follow up with this one. So th then take us back to the question before. This was one of the comparisons that really got me because I've written on issues of sexuality, spoken on this. 
but hadn't thought about shame and how it's analogous to the way we should think about sexuality. What is that connection? Yeah, um, it turns out that that uh, shame, like any um, negative or painful emotion, can go wrong. It can be unhealthy. Um, and when it does, it can be destructive. So uh, if you're um, chronically lonely, right, that, that'll, that'll wreak havoc on your on your um, on your life, um, if you feel chronically betrayed, even when you're not being betrayed, um, that'll wreak havoc on your life. And shame is no different. If 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 your feelings of shame are out of whack with the way things are in the world, that will that will have destructive effects on your life. And in fact, I think shame is more powerfully capable of destruction than are some of the other uh, negative and painful emotions. So there are people, I think, whose lives who've just been undone by extreme experiences mm. of shame. And so for a person like that to hear that somebody's out there defending shame, uh, that can be off-putting, off uh, at best offensive, yes. uh, at worst. And so I wanted to, I wanted to give an, an analogy to, to sexuality because I think the same is true of sexuality. Sexuality is um, a force that has been just utterly destructive in the lives of a lot of people. There are a lot of people for whom sexual experience has just undone them, either through abuse or dysfunction or what have you. Sexuality has been a powerful force of destruction in their lives, and they need simply to be rescued from the experience with sexuality that they've had. I think the, the same is true for shame. There are people who've just been undone by their experience of shame, and they need simply to be rescued uh, from the shame that they've mm -hmm. experienced. But, and here's where the analogy mm -hmm. uh, kicks in, we wouldn't then go on to say that because uh, a lot of people have been undone by sexuality, therefore sexuality is toxic and we do well to eradicate it from human experience. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> thinks that, right? Uh, um, a sexless uh, world is no utopia. Uh, uh, it's not gonna last, for one. <laughs> right, yeah, that's right, right. So, so I wanna say the same kind of thing about uh, shame, that though there are people perhaps a lot of people who simply need to be rescued from shame, it would be a mistake uh, uh, to conclude from that that shame is toxic and to be eradicated from human experience. The trick is to distinguish between healthy and unhealthy shame and rescue folks who've been caught up in un unhealthy shame. Well, let, let's put a philosopher's precision to just that point. Uh, what are the criteria that you use to distinguish between healthy and unhealthy shame, or appropriate and inappropriate yeah. feelings of shame. Yeah. Here I think it's helpful uh, to look at some of the other um, uh, painful felt emotions. So um, it's, it's always weird to talk about healthy expressions of painful emotions. There's something just sort of awkward about that expression. But you think about something like um, loneliness, and you ask, when is loneliness healthy? Right? And it looks like the answer is something like, when you're alone. Right? When, when you're utterly without companionship, if you're utterly without companionship and you don't feel lonely, then your emotions aren't tracking the facts on That's the ground, right? right? Mm -hmm. You're not, you're, something's broken, right? And so if you're, um, if you're only sort of um, mildly um, uh, lacking in companionship, but you feel extremely lonely, right? Then there again, your emotions are out of whack with the way things are. Um, so, uh, and the same is true for betrayal. If you feel, if you've been betrayed and you don't feel the sting of betrayal, something's wrong, uh, something's broken in your emotions. So the, the, the same is true of shame. Shame is healthy when it befits the facts on the ground. So if you've, if you've um, suffered social discrediting in a community that matters to you, then pain is the, uh, then shame is the apt emotion for that experience. Mm -hmm. If the free fall has been um, extreme, you know, so, so, some rumor has, is spreading about you on Twitter and the whole globe uh, thinks of you as a monster, mm. right? And you suffer only a tiny bit of pain about that. <laughs> well, your, your, your emotions aren't tracking mm. reality. You should, the, the pain ought to be more extreme than that. Mm. On the other hand, if you've just, um, if, if you've just suffered a, a very small diminishing of social credit in a community that matters to you and you're just racked with shame, Right. Well, then your shame is unhealthy. Or if you, um, if you're socially diminished for a short period of time, but you continue to experience the shame of that for months and years on end, we call that chronic shame. That that uh, chronic having to do with time. Chronic shame is unending shame, right? Even though uh, the experience is in the past. Those are all unhealthy expressions. Let me follow, follow yeah. up on that just quickly. I, I know, it, particularly in our cancel culture today. 
it's not un- unusual for someone to be socially discredited for things that they are entirely innocent of. Yeah. And so you can have, I think you can have a justifiable uh, disconnect between the, um, the degree to which you've been socially discredited and not feeling anything about that and be justified in not feeling anything about that if, if the allegations are entirely false. How, how does that fit into what you're describing? Yeah, I, I think the only reason, the only, the only way, so suppose you've been um, shamed in a, in a community um, for something that you haven't done, right? So you're, you're innocent. The only way you wouldn't feel the pain of shame is if you didn't care what that community thought of you, right? If you cared what that community thought of you, that would be a painful experience, even if you knew yourself to be completely innocent. And so the, the pain of shame would continue to be um, apt in those circumstances, even though you know yourself to be innocent. So, you're so s- it would just produce a different response. Yeah, that's it, right. It, it would produce, it would produce a, you know, a desire to defend yourself. Sure. And to restore your, re- your, re- your reputation, something like that. That's right. But, if it, but if, it, if it produced no painful experience of shame, that would be an indication that you just couldn't care less what this community uh, thinks about you. In fact, the, the eradication of shame from culture makes sense only in a pretty thoroughly individualistic uh, society. I think part of the reason that shame and honor have a hard time getting a foothold in contemporary Western culture, especially American culture, is because of our attachment to sort of rugged individualism as an ideal, right? You're only going to care about shame and honor if you care about what the community thinks of you, right? Are there times when, when you probably shouldn't care about what a certain community thinks of you? Sure. Uh, um, if I am kind to a person of color and I'm shamed in the Aryan Brotherhood as a consequence, right, um, that I, I suffer no felt shame. It is true that I'm shamed in the Aryan Brotherhood for be- having been kind to a person of color, uh, but I won't feel any shame. And that's because I couldn't care less what the Aryan Brotherhood <laughs> thinks about me, right? <laughs> so, but if it's a community that you care about, that you're invested in, then um, it ought to sting when you lose uh, face in that community. It's interesting on the flip side, if the Aryan Brotherhood is like, we're upset with you, Dr. Greg, it'd almost be like, good, I yeah. want you to be, <laughs> yeah. right? So yeah. you talk about how shame is somewhat relative to the culture and we're a part of different cultures. So the church versus non-Christians, like all these different societies we're a part of, our level of shame can be felt based upon how much we care about that particular community. Yeah. So one of the questions that immediately hit me, and you talk about this in your book, is the difference and or similarity between shame and between guilt. And this fascinated me because it raises questions we can come back to related to the gospel. Is the gospel about guilt? Is it about shame? Is it about both? And before we can answer that question about the gospel and what Jesus did in the cross, what is the similarity and difference between shame and guilt? Good. So the, um, the, the, they're similarly structured in that uh, guilt, like shame, is a, na- is, is a word that names both an objective condition and a subjective state. So to be guilty is to have violated some standard or other. Uh, it could be the, the, uh, the rules of a game. You could be guilty of violating the rules of a game. You could be guilty of um, uh, violating the law. You could be guilty of a moral offense. You violated the moral standard. Uh, those overlap sometimes. Sometimes they don't. But to be guilty is to have violated a standard. To feel guilty, that's the painful experience of having violated a standard that you care about. Right? You won't feel guilty for violating a standard if you don't care about that standard. Right. But you will feel guilty if you violate a standard that you care about. So guilt is always relative to some standard. There's no such thing as just plain guilt. Guilt is always relative to some standard. You're guilty with respect to this standard or guilty through. And you'll feel guilty if you care about the standard that you violated. And in a similar way, shame is always relative to a community. Right. You, 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 You can suffer for one and the same thing. You can experience honor in one community and shame in another. Right. And what you feel as that happens, will be a function of uh, how you think of those communities. And sometimes our communities overlap in complicated ways. The the, the pandemic is giving us uh, um, some nice examples of that. If you you, um, wear a mask where a lot of people aren't wearing a mask, 
right? You will, you'll be elevated in some communities, mm. right? Maybe, ele- maybe in communities that you care about, uh, mm. and you'll be shamed in others. And maybe you care about those communities <laughs> too, right? And so by wearing a mask, you can, be, you, can, you can undergo both shame relative to one community and honor relative to another community. And so our feelings can often be a, a complicated mix of felt shame and felt honor, depending on which community we're moving in. Craig, let me go back theologically to that distinction between guilt and shame, uh, because in, in, in a lot of Paul's teaching, for example, guilt is more of a forensic notion that was dealt with sort of once and for all at the, at the cross. That's not to say we don't violate standards and don't have feelings that are appropriate when we violate standards after someone's come to faith. I've often made the distinction between guilt and what I think Paul in, in 2 Corinthians calls more of a godly sorrow, which is a guilt. And I take that distinction to be a guilt that concludes I'm a bad person because of what I've done, whereas mm. godly sorrow more is I'm sad because I've hurt someone I love. You know, if, like if I, if I slept around on my wife, the, 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 real, the real thing that keeps me from doing that is not that it's wrong, which it, which it clearly is. Not that it would violate a standard, which it clearly does. But it, but that I I just I don't want to hurt someone that I desperately love. Mm-hmm. And I think the the same holds true in our in our relationship to God. So how how does that notion? And you're welcome to take issue with that idea if you like. But how does that notion fit into the your definitions of guilt and shame? Yeah. So one standard way of, of uh, one standard thing to notice about the difference between guilt and shame is this: that that uh, guilt has as its object a behavior, uh, something that you've something that you've done. Uh, so so you, you you feel guilty for having done this, and shame has as its object the person. I am a person of lesser standing in the community, uh, wh- whether or not it's because of something I've done. Maybe it's because I have. Uh, uh, a father who's done something terrible. I'll be a person of lesser standing in community, but it'll be my person, not my behavior, which is the uh, the focus. And so, one way of hearing what you're saying, Scott, is that um, when we when, when we when we do something uh, terrible of, of the kind that you mentioned, we feel both guilt and shame. Uh, we, we we feel guilt for what we've done for the behavior, but there's also a kind of negative emotion directed upon my person, which is I, I'm I'm. I'm ashamed of the of the person I've become who would be capable of doing that, and and I and I, and I feel mm-hmm. myself as a person lower in the eyes of God and in the eyes of uh, communities that matter for having become the kind of person that did that. So when we, I think what you're calling godly sh- sorrow might be something closer to shame because it takes aim at the person as opposed to the the behavior. Okay, so one fo- yeah, follow yeah. up on that. How, how then do you understand Paul's teaching in, at the beginning of Romans 8, which says, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ? Yeah. Well, here's what it can't mean, right? It, it can't mean that for those who are in Christ, they should never have, they should never again have negative uh, uh, emotions directed upon themselves or directed upon their behaviors. Yeah, you can't have a cavalier attitude about that's sin. right. So whatever condemnation means, right, in that passage, it means something stronger than just felt negative emotions directed inward. And so, insofar as shame is a is a negative emotion directed inward, right, uh, there's room for that so long as condemnation means something stronger. Okay. Very very interesting. That's helpful. So I was reading a book recently that's talking about how Westerners have this individualistic look at the scriptures and often don't understand the honor-shame culture. One of the examples that was given that I felt was helpful was the parable that Jesus tells about the workers who come throughout a different part of the day, and at the end of the day, they get the same pay. I look at that, I'm like, well, that's not fair. What, what is Jesus saying here? And it was pointed out to me that one of the things in the story was If people go home without pay, it's dishonorable to their family. So Jesus is protecting their honor, and that shifted the way that I look at it. I was like, well, that's a very interesting perspective I didn't naturally bring. Now, the reason I bring that up is we're often told that we live in purely an individualistic society, and there's a completely different Eastern culture that's honor and shame. And I think there's some truth to that. But on the flip side, I look on 
Twitter and social media, and it's like we are constantly shaming people and trying to honor people. I'm not sure it's quite that clear. One of my favorite sections in your book is that you push back on that narrative historically and even practically today. So talk about that a little bit, if you will. Yeah, I'm so glad you bring up that tension. I, I think uh, contemporary Western um, uh, society, as I'm experiencing it, has it exactly backwards in this respect. It looks mm. like we're increasingly suspicious of shame as, uh, as an emotion, and we're increasingly embracing of shaming as a tool for uh, uh, for fueling social agendas and the like of that. You mentioned cancel culture earlier as, a, as an example of this. Um, whereas I think we should be less suspicious than we are of shame, and we should recognize that it has important work to do in the formation of healthy uh, communities, and more suspicious than we are of shaming, uh, because sh shaming is almost impossible to do as an act of love. Um, so I'm glad you're bringing out that tension. Mm -hmm. On the east-west uh, point, what I've come to think is that uh, the great human wisdom traditions, East and West, uh, starting with antiquity, have always uh, uh, had a place for and have valued uh, the shame-honor dynamic and have, have given it uh, uh, sort of important places in their conception of human flourishing. Um, in the book, I have a little section where I try to, you don't have to, you don't have to really argue for that on the East. Everybody seems to know that the East is uh, a shame honor uh, culture, but yeah. but people have got the idea that's, that that's uniquely Eastern or something like that. So in the book, I, I trace uh, shame and honor through the Western canon and try to make a little case that it, it shows up there. Um, where it starts to disappear is in the post-Enlightenment West, which is precisely when we began to value individualism. And that's exactly as it should be. To the degree that you value individualism, it's going to be harder to find a place for shame and honor because you won't care about shame and honor if you don't care <laughs> what other, if you're a rugged American individual and you don't care what other people people think of you. Mm. Um, so I think it, there, there is some truth to the suggestion that in the West, uh, the shame honor dynamic is um, less pronounced. Um, but as you say, Shaming hasn't disappeared, right? We're, all. we're, no, we're all about you. it. That, that's on steroids today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it's also helpful for our, our, our audience to recognize that that, that honor-shame culture was, was also characteristic of, of biblical times, yeah. since those were largely Eastern cultures. Uh, so can you say a little bit about how, how recognizing that honor-shame background might help us under, understand and, and read the Scripture m more accurately? Yeah, if you're if if you're looking for it, you you see shame and honor all over the place in the scriptures, which is not surprising because it was written in a shame honor uh, culture. You see it right at the beginning with Adam and Eve. Their response to the fall is is a is a trope of uh, of shame. Their their naked hiding is is a trope of shameful experience. Paul uh, uh, describes himself as shaming the churches in his, his I, I say this to your shame, he says, you know, <laughs> try, trying to get them. Uh, Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah talks about a people who've lost their ability to blush. And that's just a really nice uh, picture of shamelessness, you know, uh, the loss of the ability to blush. And once you once you're alert to the shame honor dynamic, a lot of the um, the stories just read differently. In the book, I talk about the the prodigal uh, son mm -hmm. story, which I was always taught growing up in church was a story about a son who had wronged his father, had and and uh, the father instead of making him pay for his wrongdoing. Uh, forgave him and gave him sort of unconditional uh, forgiveness, and that was a sort of image of the unforgiven, uh, the un, uh, the unearned um, uh, forgiveness available to us in Jesus uh, through the cross. And maybe that's there, but that's not what would come off the page to someone who was uh, uh, informed by a shame honor culture. That the son, it, in one way of thinking about it, he hasn't done anything wrong to the father. Anyway, he, he, he squandered the money, but the money was his to squander. The father gave it to him, right? It was his to do what he wanted. And he, and he did some immoral things. He went off and, and uh, was, was living wildly and so forth. But that doesn't look like wrongdoing against the father. And when he comes back, the father never forgives him. The father never, never says anything like, I forgive you of your wrongdoing and you don't have to pay for what you've done. What the father does, having having noticed that the son had had lost all of his social standing and was eating with the pigs, mm. 
right? And that's a clear image of having descended into deep shame uh, to be at the level of the pigs. The, the father runs in his robe, which is something a dignified uh, person in that culture would never do, embraces his son, uh, kisses him, puts a ring on his finger, throws a feast in his honor, puts fancy clothes on him. He does all of these things, which would naturally be read as uh, uh, attempts to restore the son's honor, uh, not to forgive someone who's done something wrong to you. So stories like that, I think, which... Um, to the West, to the contemporary Western mind, might initially seem like stories of forgiveness, turn out to be stories of restored honor instead. I think I might be off your question, Scott. But no, that was exactly it. Yeah. Those, those are all really good examples. Mm -hmm. So this kind of brings us to what Jesus did, because you make your you, the point in the book that when somebody loses honor, it takes somebody with honor to kind of reach down and use maybe the social status that they have to pull somebody up. And when you think about it that way, Jesus' interaction with the marginalized maybe takes on a very different flavor that is sometimes missed. Talk about not only the prodigal son, that element, but in the actions and maybe even other teachings of Jesus, what he's doing to people who don't have honor in that society. Yeah, my mind goes to the uh, the woman with the bleeding issue who mm. who touched Jesus and received healing. And his first reaction to that was, uh, does he call her sister or daughter? I don't remember, but he uses familial daughter. An call, endearing call, term. Yeah. Not just endearing, but yeah. familial, right? It's, it's a family term. And, and, and he essentially says, I'm with her, mm. right? And, he, and, and by, by identifying so strongly with this woman, he took someone who, who had fallen into deep shame because of her uh, ailment and, and in essence sort of condescended to her Right by identifying with her, and so lifted her out of her uh, sh shame. And I think that's all over the place. When we talk about Jesus, it's a it's a it's a well recognized phenomenon that Jesus hung out with the sinners and spent time with the marginalized and so forth. What's less often um, noticed is that the result of that is the restored honor of those uh, marginalized communities. Let me go back to the distinction between shame and shaming and the need to be much more cautious about shaming people. Are there ever uh, instances where it's appropriate to shame someone, to call someone out? Uh, and if so, what, what kind of conditions would be necessary for that to be justifiable? Yeah, that's a really hard question. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're asking it, but it's, it's a hard question because I think the answer is yes. Um, but man, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to say yes because uh, shaming is so easily it's so much more easily done badly <laughs> than it is than done, than done well. And so even as I say yes, I think there's a place for shaming. Uh, I want to say, man, be careful with it. You know, it's like saying there's a place for anger or something like that. Anger is something you have to be really careful with. So when, so when is it uh, appropriate? Um, Sometimes, uh, so, so an example, I can't remember if I use this example in my book or not, but uh, sometimes I'll have in my, in my classes uh, a student who talks more than they should. Uh, uh, <laughs> you did use that again. Okay, yeah. It stood so, out to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so you've, you've got a student who just, who, who just, and they're shameless about it. They, mm, they have no... not self-aware. No, no self-awareness, yeah. no embarrassment that they're taking up too much air in, in, in mm. the class. And they're just, and, and, it's, and it's destructive to, uh, to the class. And so sometimes just a, just a wee bit of uh, a shaming comment from a professor, a, a comment aimed specifically at taking them down a notch in this community of people, right, can bring both them and the community into something like a more balanced uh, condition. But that's a very controlled environment. If it were, mm. if it were a student that I, it, that I knew to um, have a very low view of themselves, um, I would never do something like that. It's got to be somebody that you think can afford it, <laughs> if, if I can use that kind of uh, language. And it's got to be an environment that's controllable. If you, do, if you shame somebody on Twitter, you've done something that's completely uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. You have no control over, over how far that shaming experience is going to go. Well, and I think there's probably a, a big difference between taking someone down a notch and destroying them. That's right. Which is what I think a lot of the cancel culture intends to, I mean, hence the term, yeah. cancel culture. Yeah. Any Anytime you've acted in such a way as to 
create the impression in larger community that someone is basically a monster. Uh, you've you've shamed them in a way that I think is very difficult to justify. Well, I think this is what this is the I think the thing that might be troubling to our listeners to to hear the, just the introduction of the whole concept of shame, seeing how how easily it can go off the rails. Mm. How how do we prevent that from you know that kind of thing from happening? Because it's it doesn't it doesn't take a lot of imagination to go from shame to shaming. In a, in a really destructive way. Yeah. You've got good questions, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm so tempted to beg off on it and say, not my job. My job is to, 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 um, to assist with clarity <laughs> about these things and let the psychologists and the social scientists figure out how not to let this go off the rails. You know, let me, while you're thinking about this. Yeah. He's probably, probably going to let, let you in. off the hook. Yeah. No, well, <laughs> Please, you answer it, let, Sean. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to answer it. I think you did answer it a minute ago. Even better. <clears throat> because, yeah, right. Here's what you said when it comes to Twitter. You said there or, or Social shaming, shaming, there may be a place, but let's err on the side of trying all other steps first, kind of a Matthew 18, I go to the person, controlled environment. So it's almost to me, and add to this, tell me what I'm missing. What I took away was like, there's this mindset that on, especially in Twitter and our social media world, I'm going to shame that person. I'm going to get back at them. That's our instinct, whereas our instinct should be wait a minute, this person has dignity. How do I love this person? How do I get the correction that's needed without any further shaming that's necessary to get though, to get there? And I think a lot of our public tweeting that in other examples is to have other people weigh in so I feel good that I'm on the side of the angels and everybody says, yes, you're such a good person without thought of the person who's getting piled on. So maybe it's just a mindset we need to shift and start there. Because I think if we start with a question, okay, you've done something that's either not adequate or wrong, and I feel the responsibility to push back, mm -hmm. what's the most effective way I can do this with the least amount of shaming? If we just approach it that way, wouldn't a lot of it take care of itself? Yeah, and I think something you said there too gives us a sort of guiding question that I think is maybe the best answer to this question. It's this question, if I'm, if I'm thinking about saying something about somebody or doing something that would shame them, ask the question, can this be an act of love uh, mm. for that person? Right? Uh, not for other people that will be, benefit from my social yeah. cause or whatever, but can I do this in love for that person? And I think when I, when I shame my students in the class, gently, gently right? Uh, I'm, I'm doing it inappropriately if I can't conceive of what I'm doing as an act of love, not just for the rest of the class because they need this person to shut up, but can it be an act of love for this person? And in those, in, in, when it's done well, it can be because this person will do better. They'll get more out of their classes if they just shut up for a little while and, and let right. things. And Paul, I think when he shamed the churches, he was doing it as an act of love uh, for the churches that he was shaming. So, so that I think is the key question. Can, can I do this as an act of love? I add that term gently because I know your dean listens to the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hear that you're shaming your students. Um, but I, th I think there's probably a, maybe one of the criteria we might think about is how teachable is the person? Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got a really teachable person who's open to critique and open to, f to feedback, there's probably no need to even go down that road. Mm -hmm. But for the person who resists that initial feedback. I mean, say this, say you, you know, you talk to this, this student privately and say, you know, could you, you know, could you, you know, be, be a little bit more restrained and give other people an opportunity to jump in and you see the same behavior then repeated and it doesn't have any impact. Then I could see the next step might be that taking them down a notch. Yeah. Right. So bit, maybe you try guilt first. Right. Uh, or you, maybe you just try, <laughs> yeah, you can try awareness, you know, yeah. creating awareness of the problem. Yeah first yeah yeah sometimes uh uh felt shame can get you doing things that um that you can't feel guilty about so maybe the student just can't see uh that what they're doing is inappropriate and so they they can, even in a private conversation they can't be made to feel guilty or made to feel like they're doing yeah, doing they anything just they just don't see it but they but they might feel it 
if they're shamed in class, right? So it's the same way that uh, they're here again to come back to a contemporary issue. There are a lot of people who can't be made to feel guilty for not wearing a mask because they just don't think that masks are effective or they don't think they should have to wear a mask or whatever. They can't be made to feel guilty, but they can be shamed into wearing a mask, right? So when they walk into the grocery store and they're the only one without a mask on, they might put the mask on <laughs> Because shame is a powerful motivator. Yeah, and I think it's also helpful to recognize that the, these kinds of things can be communicated without words. That's right. I mean, just you know, somebody's body language when you walk into the grocery or that yeah. facial expression when you walk into the grocery store and you're the only one without a mask. Yeah, that's sometimes very. That's sometimes maybe even a little bit more powerful. I think it is more and, and yeah, be. more powerful and more effective. Yeah, I think these dynamics are more present than we realize. Like the example of a classroom is obvious to us. I'm reading that, I'm going, oh, I'm a teacher, I deal with this. But it's true in families, it's true in workplaces. Yeah. After reading your book, I was watching a basketball game yesterday and there's this one player who was clearly the least talented on the team. And he took a couple shots he shouldn't take because that's not his place. Shameless. Right? <laughs> totally unaware, yeah. like not doing this intentionally. And a coach could pull him over and be like, what are you doing? Like, and just berate the kid. Or you could take the Matthew 18 approach and start by saying, hey, let me give you a little context. Here's why this is not your shot. The kid doesn't get it. Then you address it. And then you start benching the kid. But some coaches would pull the player out in front of the entire you know, group that's there, berate the kid. Yeah. That's where these power dynamics get out of play. So yeah. I, to me, the principle is loving the person like you said. Yeah and taking all the steps before you make it any more painful than it needs to be That's right. for the person to get yeah, the, the lesson they need to get. Right? The principle of least, least pain for the necessary correction is a helpful one. I think that's fair. Now, I, I do want to ask one thing, in case we miss anything, like practical steps that can we can maybe do, and maybe we covered this, but in the question, I thought about it, and then you dress in your book, where does this idea that shame is bad come from? Mm -hmm. You give one word, you're like, science. <laughs> and I thought, as a <laughs> philosopher, that's very telling about who we think has authority and can describe reality to us. But without going into all the depth of the chapter, because I want people to get your book, what's, it, it seems, correct me if I'm wrong, or add to this, that these studies don't make the distinctions you're making about shame, healthy shame and unhealthy shame, and just say, we got to get rid of all of shame rather than carefully distinguishing when it's appropriate and when it's not. Is that why you take issue with a lot of the studies that are maligning shame? Yeah, it's not just that they fail to distinguish between healthy and unhealthy shame, though, though they often do. It's rather that they don't distinguish between felt shame and other emotional states, other uh, negative and self-directed emotional states like self-loathing or uh, low self-esteem, right, or other failures of self-respect. Gotcha. And so what they, what they purport to demonstrate is that felt shame correlates really strongly with things like anxiety, depression, eating disorders, suicide, rage, all of this gotcha. yuckiness, right? But if you haven't clearly distinguished between shame and, say, low self-esteem, then it won't be any surprise that whatever it is that you're tracking, right, correlates with all of this nastiness. Because we've known forever that low self-esteem correlates with anxiety, depression, uh, suicide, and so forth. So if you've been taught that uh, shame is toxic uh, or that it's unhealthy or that it correlates with all of these uh, disastrous uh, conditions, it's almost certainly because you've been taught to conflate shame with low self-esteem or self-loathing. And those things Interesting. ought to be eradicated from mm. uh, human experience. That, that, that low self-esteem and self-loathing, that's a bad business, right? And it's only if you conflate those things with shame that shame uh, comes out toxic in the studies. I think only a philosopher could have written this book just because of the precision and the care that you take. And I love reading it because we both... Well, I did the MA Phil program, which I think you did as well. Yeah. You did the Talbot yeah. MA Phil program. You teach philosophy here. Yeah. I had a student, I teach a uh, class here called Gospel Kingdom and Culture. And one of my students was telling me that your class and Tom Crisp's class was just transformative mm. to them. Now, I don't know if any students told you, I said, the first thing you need to do is go tell Dr. <laughs> Tanel Shahaf because you want to hear that as a teacher mm. that's, that 
that's significant. But just tell us and our, our viewers a little bit about, obviously this podcast is sponsored by Biola, but what's your heart for your students and what would make studying something like this and philosophy unique at Biola, maybe compared to somewhere else? Hmm. Yeah. Um, my heart for my students is that they would uh, learn how to be more reflective about uh, their own lives, that they would that they would get a vision for the beauty of the way of Jesus, uh, that it would be that it would be that the way of Jesus would become a way for them and not just uh, a collection of doctrines that they have to believe. Uh, and uh, that they would find their way out of some of the skepticism and nihilism that that so mm -hmm. animates contemporary culture. So much much of what I'm doing in the class is oriented around those goals. Uh, I'm teaching in the spring on guilt and shame, um, working through some of the social science and philosophical literature on guilt and shame. And here my hope is is uh, to help students out of uh, uh, some of the destructive shame that they've experienced, or if they've if they've come under the impression that somehow they ought to make progress towards shamelessness to try to disabuse them of that uh, mm -hmm. notion. There, there's a book by Nadia Boltz Weber. Uh, just called shameless, yeah, and I think yeah. for I think for Boltz Weber that name's a virtue. Right? I, you're and right, so, it is. and so there's a there's a real there's a real move in that direction, both inside and outside of Christian circles. Mm -hmm. And my hope is to is to help my students achieve some clarity about that. Well, you, you're doing great work in the class, outside so of the classroom. Is, this has been such a such a oh. rich discussion. Mm -hmm. yeah. So so appreciate your precision. And the clarity with which you address this, and your, I think your willingness to take on something that could bring shame to you <laughs> in some professional circles, um, <laughs> and and see you take it's it as, words, as take uh, it yeah. as more of a badge of honor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I so appreciate the book, and it's this is you know even though it's written by a professional philosopher, you don't need philosophical training to no, be to be conversant with it. It's it's does a great job of making complex things really clear. I want to highlight what you're doing here is helping Christians think biblically about a topic like shame. That's what we do at Biola. That's what we aim to do on this podcast. So think about joining us, whether an undergrad or a grad program, come learn to think biblically. That's what Biola is about. And pick up a copy of For Shame by Greg Tanelshoff. I will shamelessly plug this for you. <laughs> <laughs> because I really think it's an excellent, excellent book. And I want to have a follow-up conversation with you at some point as we talk about what it means to flourish. Is there a design argument that can be found about the role of shame that points towards intention built into our relationships? Or can evolution explain it? That's a fault conversation we'll have. But for now, we really appreciate you coming on. Well, thank you for having me on your show. You guys honor me with your attention and your attention to my book. So I appreciate it. It's fully worthy of it. Thank you. Thank you.